Welcome to Every Night is Game Night, where two busy dads get games to the table by any means necessary. Check us out, along with other great podcasts, at Dicetowernetwork.com. Every Night is Game Night, episode 129, How to Teach a Board Game in 13 Easy Steps, Part 2. Yo, my peoples, what's up? Welcome back to the Every Night is Game Night podcast. I'm your host, Jason. Thank you so, so much for joining us. Welcome back to part two of our explainer, how Anthony and I go about teaching board games. I have broken the process down into 13 steps. I really do follow this, guys. Whenever I am teaching a game, which I teach for Dex Envoy, and I do a lot of teaching, uh, you know, if I want to get all these games played and, you know, reviewed for the podcast, then I'm going to have to be the one that teaches them. So done this often enough where it just be kind of kind of becomes a routine. And I want to share the routine with people so that they have a little bit of a handle if they want to get improve uh, in terms of their teaching of games. So hopefully you're enjoying this. Um, we are splitting it into two parts, uh, partly because... <laughs> I am thinking to an interaction that we had with Brenna Noonan over at Starling Games, where she posts uh, one day, she says, enough of these long podcasts. No, I want shorter podcasts. It should be illegal uh, to do long podcasts where I can't even listen to them in the span of a dog walk. And I said, sure, that's we at ENG and uh, totally believe in that. You should be able to listen to a podcast in the span of, you know, some simple activity and then be able to, you know, drop it and move on to the next thing. So, yes, that's exactly what you are getting from us. You are getting short episodes, which means you get a lot of episodes in two parts, which isn't so bad. Uh, I don't think so anyway. If you guys uh, disagree, if you want a longer podcast, if you want, you know, kind of us to keep changing the content, please reach out. We always give contact at the end of the episode. Well, let's do it at the beginning. ENGN underscore podcast on the Twitter. Every night is giving my Facebook group. Those are the two primary ways that you can reach out. I love getting messages. So please, please uh, join us and continue to interact with us. All right. So before we get to part two of our teaching games episodes, uh, let's get to Liz. Liz, what are you peeping on Kickstarter? Hey, gamers. This is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire, and I'm here to encourage your Every Night is Game Night acquisition disorder. This week I want to talk about the pursuit of happiness from Artipia Games. Have you ever thought about what a perfect, happy life would look like? Do you want to create that life in the form of a board game? If you do, then the pursuit of happiness may be for you. Starting from birth, you'll use a worker placement mechanism to get jobs, raise a family, buy stuff, and generally see how much goodness you can pack into a single lifetime. In addition to the base game, you can pick up the experiences and community expansions, which will allow you to travel and to draw satisfaction from being part of the community where you live. Rarely do I encounter a board game with such an interesting theme. They say money can't buy happiness, but right now on Kickstarter, it can at least buy you the pursuit of it. Happy gaming! All right. Thank you very much, Liz. On to the episode. Like I said at the beginning, this is part two of our method of teaching games. Just to recap from last week's episode, uh, we presented the first five steps that I've developed, uh, one being this kind of preparatory step, uh, steps two through four being things that you do in order to build the table. People aren't sitting down, but you want to get them to sit down and be as receptive and enthusiastic as possible, which makes teaching easier. So that was steps two through four. Step five was the quote unquote verb of the game. Uh, the phrase that I used was in this game, you are a blank trying to do blank. Uh, so give the verb of the game, you know, give the theme if that is applicable. So that kind of gets us ready to jump in. Let's get to step six. Okay, so step six, this is something, I remember mentioning this in the last time we recorded this, and you were like, oh, I don't do that. <laughs> uh, I do, uh, depending, I mean, and I get like, do whatever, depending on the group. And I got this from a podcast called The Snakes Cast. So this is a Snakes and Lattes cast that, um, I, I don't know if it's still running or something like that. I'm, I'm, I believe it is, it just kind of like changes something I don't listen to anymore. But I love this tip. The tip is, to actually demonstrate game flow. So like, you know, you say you're doing stuff, but actually, you know, getting on the board, let's say you're demonstrating worker placement, like you're taking your workers up from the board, you're putting them on the different spaces. Let's say it's Lords of Waterdeep, you're putting them on the builder space, you take the building, you put it on the 
uh, the space where there is the building. And you just kind of like do that in a simulated way just so people can kind of see what's happening on the board and what the board will look like in a turn or two so that it registers something for them where it's like, oh, or maybe you're teaching Seven Wonders, like you demonstrate putting the card under your little cardboard thing. Um, I definitely find that works more for the casual crowd, or especially if I'm teaching at a bar. <laughs> yeah. If I'm teaching at a bar, then the visual the better because they're only hearing 50% of what I'm saying anyway, if that. Um, you know, if you, Anthony, Anthony plays at a library and like a quiet cafe. So I don't think that it's as necessary, but it's a nice tip to have in your back pocket in case you need it to kind of reinforce, you know, some of the actions that are going on in the game. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. I like the idea of it, but it is definitely, I think something more for, you know, non-experienced gamers. I don't teach a lot of people who haven't played a lot of games. Um, at least not the games that I bring in would teach. If, if we're playing something simpler like that, presumably someone else is teaching it. Although what I will say is you did it. I, or maybe I'm misremembering, but I, but when we played Tale to Wakan, you, you took the die and you moved it around the board. Just like just that little simple message of like, Oh, that's what the die is. You don't roll it. You don't do nothing. Like you actually just, it's a work or you move it around the board. Yeah. I don't know if you, me- I don't know if you remember doing it, but like there it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good point. I, I think it's, and I'm just thinking this as you're talking, but I think it's important to do really to illustrate anything if it's different than what you might expect, right? Yes. So yes, in that correct. game, you get three dice. And when you get dice, you want to roll them. You do not roll dice in this game ever. Like it's not at no point in the game, unless you want to use them to, for who goes first, do you ever roll the dice. So it's important to show people this is how the dice are going to work. And this is when you're going to change them. This is the direction they're going to move. This is how far they can move. So, so yeah, I think that is important, you know, to your point. Yeah, I, I, that's a really good point. Like, you know, especially when the, you, it goes counterintuitive because, I mean, we want games to kind of be unique. We don't want them to play the same old stuff. So, you know, when a game does something that's against type, so like, let's say, you know, uh, uh, my friend John designed a game where you actually you discard into a discard pile face down. You kind of want to show that. Because people are just going to discard face up, <laughs> you know? yeah. Given to their own devices, and there's so many little ways in which games kind of mess, you know, mess with their meta. Yes, and it's it's a really good thing in terms of repetition, which we're repeating ourselves a lot in this podcast because that's good teaching. Good teaching is repetition. It'll it'll get in there. So I'm not going to apologize for that. So we uh, <laughs> going to repeat myself a little bit. Um. So yeah. So I'm definitely handsy. Try to be skillful with that. That's when something definitely practice. I like Anthony's idea of being aware of, you know, when a point needs emphasis and usually counterintuitive things need a lot of emphasis. Okay. So then what I like to do is like, I will like, you know, do the motion thing and then I'll kind of lead it into step seven, which is the victory condition. So it's like, I've started to, you know, in this game, you are building and you're doing this, this, and this, and then this is the end of the game. Like, this is how you win. So then you know, so I, in teaching, they call it teach, teach towards the end or like teach from the end backwards. So, you know, like you saying, okay, most points wins and you do it in a general way. Don't like break it down. Like you are, you're just warming up the table at this point. You put, put it this way. This is almost like your topic sentence of a paragraph. And then you're going to explain the topic sentence in the rest of your essay. But just in one sentence, just discuss how the, how, um, how the game ends. So like in Terraforming Mars, the game ends when the terraforming tracks are full. People can understand that, you know, and then, you know, we'll go, you know, you do one more round or whatever it is. Uh, or in Scythe, the game ends usually too soon. <laughs> <laughs> Without warning. They, <laughs> it's like, whoa. <laughs> or in Splendor, the game ends when, you know, you get 15 points. So, you know, you, you say that in, and you say that initially, you plant that seed and you're going to reiterate that later. It's like any good essay. Like, you know, you do your topic sentence and then later in the essay, you're going to, you know, refer back to that thing. So in a general way, you know, just kind of let people know how the game ends and how they win. Because at the end of the game, why, at the end of the day, why are we playing? We're playing to win. And that's the thing that's going to be the most interesting to people. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That is the introductory paragraph. 
<laughs> if we could think of a, you know, I, 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 I hate putting it out there because it sounds so like lame just comparing teaching to like writing an essay. <laughs> it's like the worst thing to do, but you, you think about it and it's like, okay, what people do want logical flow. And you know, that's a nice little logical flow. And like, we're, we're, all we're doing is presenting a structure and you make it fun and you know, you do what you want with it. You know, I like the idea of play with structure, and that's what we're doing. So like, we just gave you elements towards an introductory paragraph of playing. All right, and just to be absolutely clear of that structure that we're talking about, uh, this is steps five, six, and seven. That is your intro before you get to the guts of the teach. Uh, so step five, in this game, you're a blank, trying to do blank. Step six, demonstrate that flow of the game, either by tactile moving pieces or just kind of talking through it. And then step seven is you're explaining the goal of the game. Most points, um, most dudes in a map cross this threshold you're right playing a race game follow uh cross the finish line over there that is that will set you up for success that will set you up for a good foundation so that when you are teaching that kind of nitty-gritty player actions players have a context they understand not just what they're doing but why they're doing it all right so let us get on to step eight yeah <laughs> we are powering through these steps over here uh step eight is you know just let's get started we're teaching mechanisms over here so actually you know what i'm going to take a step back because i think this is where we differ a little bit what i like to do is i like to teach basic actions first like player actions i like to just go straight to the player board and say, okay, you know, you have this in front of you, and you can take these actions. You get three actions in a turn, or you get one action in a turn. You can, you know, do 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 whatever. And then I'll, you know, go into the rest of the stuff later. Some teachers they'll take the player aid and they'll run through the one, two, three, four, five, six steps. So like sometimes, you know, there's an enemy step at step one. They'll go through the enemy step, and then they'll go through the player step. Then they'll go to like the upkeep phase or whatever. I don't like to do that. I like to go player out. You know, start with the player and go out. So do you have a thought about that? Um, yeah, I mean, I I think it's important. It's one of the first things I do. But before that, I typically spend at least a couple minutes describing uh, the the play space, the shared play space, because that's what everybody's looking at. Um, you know, this is the, in this game, blah, blah, blah. This is what you're doing. But here's the board. Here are the different spaces you're going to be moving. Here's how you're going to be moving around the board. Here's when you're going to be moving onto the board. And now let's jump back and look at um, how the how the turn flows, what actions are available to you. So kind of a top-down approach of like, here's everything that you'll be interacting with. Then here's the round structure in which you will be interacting with it. And then finally, here are the specific actions you can take within that round structure and and when you want to do that. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like if I jump straight to like player actions, it's not enough context, especially in a little bit heavier games on the lighter games for sure. Yeah. This is what you do. Now here's the situations in which you interact with things, but in a heavier game, it's just like, now you're going to buy wheat and you're going to, this allows you to trade the wheat and people are like, for what and why, you know, like what's the <laughs> point of any of that. I'm like, I, I need to make sure I tell you what the point of that is before we get to that, what you're actually doing. Right. Right. I, I find it it's it different depending on if there's a player piece on the board. Like if there's a player piece, people have this ability to kind of like put themselves in the player piece and they kind of go from there. So like pandemic, say, like you mentioned before, like, you know, a simple game. I'll always mention player actions first and then I'll do everything else because the piece is already on the board and I can just like take the piece and go to the different cities and demonstrate, okay, this is moving. This is discarding our card to fly. This is removing a cube. And, you know, before I even do anything, you know, I find that is helpful. But I guess in terms of what you're talking about, like the games that you play, there are no player pieces. It's just like a, bu a big board and it kind of commands your eyes. So maybe the good advice there is like, okay, where are people's eyes going, <laughs> you know, and like, you know, giving them a context of that and then like kind of filling in from there. Yeah, for sure. I'm like, if you put a big pile of stuff in front of people, that's what they're going to focus on first. But, you know, you mentioned Tate to walk in earlier that game, there's really nothing in front of you at the beginning except, like, a couple of resources you get. So nobody's really looking at any of that. They're like, well, what, what do we do with the board? What is the board? What is all this? You know? Is it... What's that pyramid? What's those tiles? <laughs> yeah, exactly. They want to know what everything is. And so, I, you know, in that game, I start with, like, it's, you know, a rondelle, or you're moving around this thing, always in the same direction. This is how you move around. This is when you move around. And now here are the actions when you move around. Um, 
And then finally, after all that, I'm like, and here's all the stuff you get and what you'll do with it. Mm-hmm. Okay. I mean, there's like for that one, for this category, you know, you can do that however you want. Like there's, 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 you can either follow, like a lot of people follow the player aid. Like I don't, like I actually hate giving players player aids before the teach, the teach, right? I, I think the set up and sit down people like hate that word, the teach. <laughs> I don't know if you heard about that. No. Did you hear about that? They, they, they use the nasty uh, D word to describe people who talk about the teach. I, yeah, that sounds dumb, but sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, whatever. <laughs> I'll touch. I'll talk. Teach anyway. So, um, like you can organize it however you want. Like, like they're legit. Some people who love handing out player aids. I don't like it because I find that it's very distracting. Like they're looking at the player aid, not listening to you. So when you're going down the the you know the different list of actions, that it's very distracting. Like I find it more helpful to like you know internalize the player aid and then teach those actions and then give out the player aid after the fact as a reinforcer. So that they don't spend their entire time looking at that stupid player aid. I don't know. Do you have any uh, thoughts about that? Yeah, I tend to hold them back. Um, same thing. They are distracting. People start looking at them. They start asking you what's on there, and you're like, just ignore it for now. <laughs> you're like, well, you gave it to me. <laughs> like... uh, yeah. So then I broke this next. So that was step eight. You know, there's a lot of different approaches to that, but what I find is if you set the game up well enough and you, you give people that that those touchstones then this next part will kind of flow naturally. So I'm not too worried about that. Uh, but then step nine is about interactions. So if step eight was about actions, step nine will be about interactions. What do I mean by that? So cooperative game, the game is going to influence you, set you back, take resources from you. In a Euro game, the interactions are a little bit less, but here's how people can block your movements or deny you resources in terms of, you know, like a combat mechanism. So like, let's say you're playing a directly competitive game. Um, I actually will save describing the combat mechanism until after I've described movement and personal upgrades and how your board works and all that kind of stuff. I actually kind of get a little crazy when somebody, like, they get so excited about a co- the combat in a game that they describe that before they describe how I even enter. <laughs> combat should be the last thing you describe in a game. Like, it's not, like, maybe, like, end conditions and everything else. But combat, like, there's a reason it's always at the end of the rule books too. It's not, you need to know how you get there before you actually talk about what you do in it. Right, and I, I get it. Like that's the most fun part, and people are like, "Okay, how can I fight?" You know, yeah. <laughs> uh, or even even in a game like King of Tokyo, like I won't describe like how the fighting works because it works in kind of a funky way. If you're here, you're going like, to one person. If you're in the middle, you could attack everybody. Like describe the dice first, describe the rolling first, and describe the signing, assigning stuff, and getting the cubes and everything. And then describe how damage works and all that kind of stuff. So, I, I, you know, in terms of, like, keeping things logically there, I like to describe what you can do and then describe the points of interaction. I guess that's the, probably the best way to do it, the best way to think about it. It's like, okay, describe the person first and then if they're interacting in any way. Like, if it's direct combat or if there's, you know, like, like gotcha stuff or if somebody can kind of take resources from you then you know you want to fill that in like and especially this is especially important where anthony was talking about where you learn the game first and you figure out oh this is what could trip a person up or this is what a person could look for this is where a person could get screwed you know like because they, they didn't pay attention to this so but you know describe what they're doing first and then talk about how players can get screwed up and that's where playing the game first will kind of reveal that a little bit more than reading the rule book Oh, for sure. Yeah, and it helps immensely. I mean, there's always those people who are just like, let's just go. I want to get into it. But, you know, if you remind them of all the things that they're going to have to deal with, like, hey, by the way, at a certain point, you need to have these resources because you've got to feed these people or whatever, you know, something like that. <laughs> that that's something that's easy to forget and to teach because it's a small little thing at the end of a scoring round. But, man, people will get mad if you forgot that. So... <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, I should call step nine. Talk about feed your people. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> that'll get you every time. <laughs> All right. So then you've described what people can do. You've described how people can get stopped and the the points of interaction in a game. 
Step 10, now you flesh out that end game. There, it is a very frustrating experience when players are not clear how a game ends. So that, you know, what is the victory point threshold? Or like in a Kinesia game, I played, I think it was, this isn't a Kinesia game, but I know he does this. Um, what was it Heaven and Ale? Where I, I, it's one of those Euro games where you go up in a bunch of tracks and you only score for the lowest that you've achieved. You yeah. don't have to score for the highest. Like you really want that's the like if you don't know that's coming if that's not clear that is so annoying and it could it could be so off putting to a player. Oh my gosh! And, and if you don't know that's coming and someone's teaching you the game, they are not paying attention to what you're doing because <laughs> like in heaven and ale, if somebody's just like leaves something down in the zeros and runs something else up to max score, someone should probably point that out. <laughs> you know so like um yeah and and he just even in a in any kind of euro game in general there's that pivot point where in the first part of the game you build up your engine and then there's there's a there's a scoring phase so like letting people know the end game will let people know that pivot point or give the people at least a flag that's like oh the end game is coming i better like actually fire off this engine that i've been making you know yeah yeah you don't want somebody that's sitting there collecting resources when there's two rounds left and you're like you should spend that like <laughs> it's not they need to know that absolutely so like you know we're talking about your games but like in any game like you know uh um you know let's say it's a comp- competitive game and you can win and you know especially if there's multiple ways to win so like you know you're thinking you're playing a competitive game you know like a like a direct combat game and you think like oh i'm going to conquer all the enemies and everything and then some person like captures a flag and it's like oh all i have to do is capture the flag really <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, I know I talked about describing the end game in general before. That's a topic sentence. This is the paragraph. Spend time. Like, you know, be thorough. This is how the game can end. And this, you know, every game does this differently. Does the game end immediately when somebody achieves the victory, the condition, or do you get an extra round, you know? So, and or like, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, you know, uh, finish the round or like, you know, everyone gets his turn after you know, it, like, you know, that's that seems like it might not matter too much, but it really kind of does, you know? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you, it affects how you're planning. It affects how you in, interact with other people. You, you need you need to understand these things. And when you don't, people get mad, understandably. So that was step 10, flesh out the end game. Step 11. Now, this is kind of the end. This is where you this is where I like to kind of wrap things up. Now, selectively talk about like special cards player powers you know uh you know a lot in a lot of these games there's usually a bunch of common actions that anybody can do give people a heads up like okay then you point to their player boards then you point to their cards and you say okay look out for this this is your special power do you know um make sure that you're making accounting for this every turn you know because in a lot of games you know people are doing their basic stuff and they don't realize that they could do more so, but, but, you know, but definitely save that towards the end. Yeah, for sure. It just confuses people. You throw it out there early. I played plenty of games where I'm like, I don't understand at all what I'm supposed to do with any of this. And you just ignore it then. You're not doing all the fun, cool stuff that you should be doing. Yeah. Um, sometimes when I'm like teaching a newer group, I don't recommend doing this for a experience group, but I'll kind of construct the game in a way where... Like if let's say it's like King of Tokyo and I, I'll, I'll kind of, de- I'll pre-construct the powers deck so that easy powers come out. So like extra head, simple, right? Roll an extra die <laughs> or something like that. Uh, or like, you know, I'll, or I think even rule books do this. I'll say, okay, play with these cards, play with this opening hand or whatever it is. And then the next game play with nothing. Like, do you bother doing that or, or what? No, um, not necessarily, but what I will do is, like, if a game has asymmetrical starting whatever, I will just say these are the ones we're going to use because, you know, these are a little bit more complicated. And there's a lot of games like that. Spirit Island or Marco Polo, Twilight Imperium. Like, there are some that are easy and some that are more complicated. That's the fun of the game. You work your way up to it. So I will kind of curate that kind of stuff. Um, I don't tend to, like, stack the deck or anything. Uh, mm-hmm. At least not with those types of games because I don't feel like they're that complicated for people who've played euros before you know that's not necessary um most of the time but i have in the past removed some cards you know that i'm like this card is dumb because it does dumb things that everybody gets mad at we're not going to use this 
Uh, <laughs> you, know, you know, like like the the what is that the the base jump card in uh, Summit? Oh my god! <laughs> well, that just breaks the whole game. That's not even. <laughs> If you guys don't know, if you, we, we reviewed the game Summit, it's not a popular game. Uh, unfortunately, it kind of fell short of expectations. But there's one card that you know you're, you're scaling the the mountain, and then if you jump off, the, like if you play this card, you actually jump off the mountain and you basically teleport to the bottom. Which if and it's a roll, so if you roll well, then you win the game, and if you roll poorly, then you're eliminated. And it's like this is what kind of card is this? What's happening? <laughs> so bad. <laughs> <laughs> anyway I, I ruined your flow my man i'm sorry about that yeah uh and my other thing is don't play bad games that that makes it easier to teach um <laughs> there you go. yeah no but for sure it's uh it's it's all about making sure that people feel comfortable and able to do the things that they want to do in the game so if there's mechanics in the game that kind of break that um maybe leave those out and often the rule book will help you with that it'll say like oh this part where you stab each other in the back repeatedly and remove all the actions that the other people did. That's the advanced version of the game. So don't do that with new players. Right. I'm like, thank you, rule book. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So uh, that is eleven steps so far. We are towards the end, man. Uh, so now the players are starting to play. We are at the table. Does that mean that you can walk away from the table? Uh, try not to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of times teachers would be like, okay, you good? All right. <laughs> I got this other table. Sometimes you can't avoid that. But, you know, if you're hanging out, which is the ideal, um, how there's there's actually two questions that come up in terms of etiquette uh, that are worth discussing. And I'd like to hear your thoughts. Um, the first one is, do you try to win games that you teach? No, but I also don't try to lose them. Um, okay. How, how do you manage that? Well, there's a couple different ways. I mean, one is do something different than I've ever done. You know, if it's a game I've played several times, like I'm going to try this stupid strategy that I know is not going to work. Um, it's fun. I'm trying something different. It probably won't work, but at least I'm not just tanking a game. Um, I don't get to play a lot of games, so it's difficult for me to like spend you know two three hours teaching people a game and then just intentionally lose it. So to make mm -hmm. other people, but what I will do too is like if people just are not getting it or having issues, I will certainly help them if they're willing to to listen um, at the detriment to my own score. And also, if there are situations in which I could do more. I frequently choose not to. I'm like, well, if I picked up that, I could chain off that and get these points plus this, plus this, plus that. I'm like, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to let someone else grab that. It's fine. Um, so it's not mm. like I'm not intentionally losing the game, but I'm also not really trying to win. I'm not, I don't know. It's, it's hard to describe, but it, at the same time, it's ideally I, I don't like get blown out in last place, but I'm also not stomping all over everybody. Uh, our friend Michael Kelly over at Copcast calls it being a lose ninja, where you're trying to lose, but you're not trying to look like you're losing. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, realistically, I mean, unless you have like a really dedicated group of gamers that's just in for whatever, most people will have a better experience if they win a game. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's obviously that's going to be the case for most people. Um it's difficult though. Like sometimes people just really don't want to win a game. Like, you're like <laughs> <laughs> they're so bad. <laughs> I I played Rise of Tribes with a group of people. All three of them were new to the game and generally new to you know heavier games in general. And I was very much trying to lose that game. And I because that's that's the kind of game where you just keep scoring. Like once you start scoring points, you score points every round, and you only need like fifteen to win. Right. Um, and so I couldn't slow it down any more than I already had. And I was just like, just do that. Come on. <laughs> and just like, yeah. Oh man. Like you can only try so hard. It depends. Like I, I demoed near and far a bunch, uh, for like a Dex Envoy, you know, like, like one of the weekend splashes. So I like, played like eight games of it and I was crushing. <laughs> so, <laughs> I was like, cause it's a hard game to kind of grok and to be very big. I know you don't, you're not a huge locket fan. Um, so you, you don't have too much exposure to it, but like it's hard to know. You know, okay, go to the town and then when to go out to exploring and what exploring actually does for you. Like, I actually find it helpful to play well 
as an example to other people. Okay, oh, you did this, you did this, I saw you do this, you saw this. Like, you know, have a good humor about it. Like, I actually used my playing well as a teaching opportunity where it's like, you see where I did this, you see where I did this. You know, I I knew I was going to win, but I don't like lord it over people. So I think in that one example, it's actually okay to go for the win if you're making it as part of your te- as part of the communicating of how to play well in the game. Like, don't lord it over people. Like, if you're going to be lording, lording it over people, then you're going to want to hold back on that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you need to win, probably don't play with a bunch of new gamers. Like, yeah, it's an easy win, but come on, man. Like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, And then the other thing, the other issue that comes up in terms of, like, teacher etiquette during a game is how much strategy talk do you give? Do you, you know, if people are struggling, do you be like, um... You might want to try this, or you might want to do that, and you know, generally the the best opening strategy is this. In Terraforming Mars, he's the best place to put your first ocean or your first city. Uh, or, you know, in uh, Spirit Island, it's better to like you know, uh, build up this and focus on your own thing. Like, how do you, how much do you give strategy talk as a teaching tool during the game? I try to be as general as possible, um, and you know, I'll remind people of things throughout the game. Like, just remember. This resource is worth nothing at the end. Spend it, spend it, spend it. Or just remember, you know, typical scores are around X, Y, Z. If people start to zone out and be like, I'm not doing very well or whatever it is. Right. Um, I don't I don't like to jump in and like tell people like, oh, you could do this and then that'll help you do this because then you're playing the game for them. And a lot of people, especially in Euro games, don't respond well to that. Like part of the fun of those games um, I can attest to is the puzzle. You're trying to solve the puzzle. So if somebody else is helping you solve the puzzle, you're taking some of the enjoyment away from them. But if you're reminding them of rules, they maybe forgot or actions that they're not looking at or, you know, possible combinations that they're missing because they don't remember a rule. You know, it, there's a lot of rules mm-hmm. that you're internalizing. So if you forgot that something's even available, like, Oh, you could just go there and pass your turn and collect resources that you can use your next turn. Like, that type of thing is often just forgotten. So I try to keep that stuff top of mind and help people out with that um, as much as I can, because those are the areas where people get mad, especially then if I go do it and they're like, Oh, I didn't know I could do that. (laughs) I told you. (laughs) Right. Um, Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like there's certain stuff like in seven wonders, I'll point out that, okay, if you're totally lost, play a Brown card first which is a resource which will let you do stuff later. Like foundational things, I'll let people know. Yeah. You know, if there's, you know, if, if you have to do a certain thing in order for the rest of the game to even work, then I'm going to make sure that people know it. And I might, you know, like you were saying before, like it's, there's an art to it. Like, you know, if they're, if they're not struggling, then don't do anything. Uh, but if they're struggling and I have to kind of see, you know, assess – are they just forgetting something? Do they just like they they nodded their head yes and they're ready to play, but they didn't really get it, you know? So there's an art to the noticing that. So there's no real kind of way to look for it. But if they're missing something that's completely foundational to the whole experience, then yeah, you're gonna want to point that out and say, okay, you know, you want to think about. You know, uh, I'm trying to think of another like you know, seven one is pretty easy. Like I'm trying to think of another game where like you know, if you don't do a certain thing, then the whole game's gonna fall apart. Ah, uh, yeah. I mean, it's. A lot of games. Like you reviewed a game, you reviewed a game in the Euro, uh, and when we did the Gen Con Euro episode, where it's like, okay, you must score on this certain track. I think it was like Coimbra or something like that. Oh yeah, Coimbra is a great example. I mean, it's uh, there's no like one specific thing you need to do, but you do need to like focus in on a couple areas, and you need to have income, some kind of income, otherwise you're not going to be able to do anything. So right. that that game is a good example. Another thing I'll do is I'll remind people like. These are the cards that are coming up because in a game like that, for example, you see every single card in the entire game. And some games are like this, some aren't. Like, I'm not going to tell people, oh, in that terraforming Mars deck, there's a a meteor that could blow up all your plants. Maybe it'll come out. Probably not. Um, But what I will do is say early in a game, if you are collecting a lot of plants and nobody else is, that is a bad idea. Like, don't do that. <laughs> and that's not something that comes up in the rules. That's just something you know and that you tell people who haven't played before because that is a bad experience if, to get introduced to a game. Um, 
so if there's something you need to do, if there's cards that are going to come out, they're going to impact what you're doing and how you're doing it. Like, oh, scoring cards are going to come out in the second round or the third round. So you need to be specialized in one thing so that you can grab a scoring card. And you need one of those to win the game. Um, right. That kind of information is important. That's part of the teach usually, but often it's also a reminder halfway through the game. Yep. Uh, so that's, so, I mean, and both of those questions, you know, do you try to win and how much strategy talk do you give? I think the correct answer in both of those things is they're both allowed in the service of teaching, in the service of giving players access to the game. It, don't try to win and, and put your own personal stuff into it, get personal satisfaction out of it. That's not good. Uh, don't try to give strategy. Don't try to play for another person. That's not great. So the line between those two, you know, what is actual teaching, what is helping, and what is just for yourself? Like, we struggle with that in life. You know, <laughs> you know, we don't know, we don't know the line between like what is genuinely helpful and what is just unnecessary. So you're gonna have to kind of play with that, but don't just, say no. Like, you know, if somebody's really struggling, go ahead and throw them a strategy tip. Or, you know, if someone, you know, if you, like like I did with Near and Far, like if, if you want to play well, just play well, but like, don't be a jerk about it. Just, you know, use it to open up, you know, let people see what you did so that maybe next time they can play a little bit better. So, um, you know, those, that's how we're going to approach those two questions. Step 13 is the last is the last one. This is a part of teaching that's kind of underrated as well, is thinking about the how the game went so i think you you know like you know in any game it's kind of natural to kind of debrief about a game and say okay i like this i didn't like this you know this was not clear next time i play this i'm gonna i'm gonna make sure that i emphasize this or i wish i'd known this and all that kind of stuff like ask the players like be verbal about that say you know what how was that did you understand everything you know uh, you lost, you know, why do you think you lose? Did you think you lost because of skill or was there something not clear? All that kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's uh, especially in a big, long game um, from my side, if you play a game for three or four hours, you want to make sure that A, everybody got it and feels comfortable with where they ended up. Uh, and B, you know, just kind of talk people through and help them think about what would you do next time, especially if you want to play the game again, right? Um, if, if you're demoing, <laughs> happens so rarely, man. It happens so I rarely. I know that's for us. No <laughs> kidding. If you're demoing a game or something, then you know yeah, you yeah. want them to want to play the game. If you're bringing your own game to game night, you're like, I want to bring this again next week. Who's in? And this is kind of a good way to get a good sense of like who got it, who didn't, why they didn't get it, and it can also help you improve how you teach later. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, be verbal about that. I mean, when it comes to like, I was a teacher, you know, I probably should have said that like at the very, very beginning that I was a high school teacher for three years and I thought I was pretty darn good. Um, you know, I, this is like basic pedagogy stuff. Like, you know, want to constantly be thinking about how you're teaching, whether you're teaching or not, you know, like whether it's done, uh, you know, don't, don't just disappear. Don't just like, say, okay, all right, done. You know, I'm, I'm good to go. You know, ask them, like, let, ask for feedback, ask for, you know, ask people experiences. Like, and, and it just feels good when people say, yeah, I had a lot of fun. Uh, I thought I could win and I had all the tools that I could win and that was great. <laughs> you know, oh, if there's something that was rough, you know, they say, oh, well, I wish I had known this. And people generally won't accuse you. I think gamers are nice, right? You know, for the most part. Yeah, I think so. There are some people yeah, who they, just like instantly get on you about every little thing you forgot, but most people are pretty cool. Yeah, most people they use the passive voice. It's like, I wish I'd have understood this. Yeah. And you can use that as a oh, okay. Next time I teach this, I'll try to, you know, highlight this a little bit better. Yeah. Um and then that that actually and loops back to step one, knowing the game. <laughs> you know? We come back to the full circle. You, now you've prepared the game a little bit more and you're ready to go through all thirteen steps again. That was 13 Steps of Teaching. Uh, thank you guys very much for being with us on this journey. Very, very thorough, but I hope that you guys got a lot out of, or at least a little bit. Maybe it was just entertaining for you, and you're, you're a really great teacher anyway. I'm at, I have a couple of game friends who are teachers out there that are going, uh. <laughs> <laughs> don't quite do it that way. But uh, either way, I uh, hope you guys enjoyed. And that's going to do it for another episode of Every Night is Game Night. Once again, thank you so, so much for joining us. Uh, if you are interested in kind of going a little bit further and really, you know, internalizing those 13 steps, I have them written out on the show notes uh, for both episodes. So steps one through five are on the previous episode and steps six through 13 are on this episode. 
So, you know, not going to go over the whole thing. <laughs> I think you're pretty, everybody's pretty tired of me hearing me repeat myself at this point. So, yeah. Uh, and if you want to interact with us, yep, I gave you all the information at the beginning. Uh, I'll give it again. Why not? Um, I'm really excited to share. Ian underscore podcast on the Twitter, Every Night is Game Night Facebook group, uh, Every Night is Game Night.com, the sister to Board Game is Anonymous.com. Uh, all over the place we are ready and accessible. So until next week, go ahead and grab a game off of that shelf and let's make every night a game night.